Okay, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, um, who is uh, Debbie Kennett. Debbie is Honorary Clinical uh, Research Associate, Honorary Re Research Associate at uh, University College London. Uh, she's the author of the very popular genetic genealogy blog, Cruise News, and she's an author as well, having authored DNA and Social Networking, and also the Surname Handbook. That's right. So uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Debbie. She's going to talk to us about a really fascinating topic, and that is the mysteries of the Titanic solved by DNA. Uh, so this should be a really, really interesting and very appropriate uh, presentation for where we are today. So please give a warm welcome for Debbie Kennett. Thank you. Well, it's, can you hear me? Oh, I must unmute right. you. And it's over here. Sorry. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, it's been an interesting experience uh, compiling this talk, and I've actually found it quite emotional because I think part of family history research is exploring the lives of the individuals and, and somehow when you look at disasters in the abstract it doesn't mean very much but once you get down to the individual people it suddenly has much more meaning. Uh, I'm going to be looking today at um, two different um, cases that where DNA testing was used. Um, in the first case to try and identify some of the bodies and in the second case, um, where someone came forward later on who claimed to be descended from someone who was, who was on the Titanic. Now, the, the Titanic itself obviously needs no introduction. It was the world's uh, the, the largest and the most opulent uh, steamliner when it was uh, first launched. And it was actually launched from the docks here 107 years ago. I went out yesterday walking around the docks trying to imagine the scenes. There were 100,000 people who turned out for the launch of this boat. So the docks out there must have been packed with people, all really excited at this marvellous uh, feat of engineering. Harlan and Wolf were the largest and most productive shipyard in the world, and it was the pride of Belfast. So after the launch, it went off to be fitted out with all the, the fancy uh, chandeliers and all the, the lavish interiors, and it had, then was tested for seaworthiness, and on the 10th of April, it set sail from Southampton on its maiden voyage to New York, stopping on the way in France and also in Ireland. And as everyone knows, four days into the voyage, it hit the iceberg and it sank with a colossal loss, loss of life. Now, one thing I found, it's actually very difficult to find exact figures of the number of people who were on the Titanic and how many lost their lives. So the figures I put up here are estimates. They may be slightly higher, they may be slightly less. The ship itself wasn't completely booked out, it had capacity for many more people, but there were 2, roughly 2,344 people on the ship. Um, we had the first class passengers with all the, the high society people paying $80,000 for their trip across the Atlantic, but the bulk of the passengers were the, the third class passengers who were the emigrants setting off for a new life in the new world. And it was a most fantastic ship. The photo there is actually a model that's in the Titanic Hotel. And it just gives you an idea of the, the size and the sort of sheer scale of, of, the, of, the, sh of the ship. There were 908 crew members. Um, the numbers don't add up to 2344 because there were also some additional people who were from Harland and Wolfe who were there for the main voyage. There were 3,500 life jackets on the boat, more than enough for every person on the ship. But, as you probably know, there were only 20 lifeboats. So the lifeboats only had capacity for less than half of the people on the ship. And remarkably, the lifeboat capacity actually met the Board of Trade requirements. Um, the, uh, when, they, the, when the boat was launched, they decided they didn't want to have quite as many. They, they actually had capacity for 64 lifeboats. They decided they didn't want to have so many because it, um, it, it upset the design of the, 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 the decks of the ship. So they didn't have as many life, uh, lifeboats on board as they could have done. Um, there were roughly 1,517 Titanic victims. It may be more, it may be less than that. We really don't know the exact number. Um, and of those, 63% of the passengers lost their lives. Uh, but there are stark differences depending on where you were in the ship. 
9% of the first class passengers lost their lives, 58% in standard class, and 76% of those in third class. And the, the crew also, 76% of them lost their lives. If you were a female, you had a much better chance of surviving than a male. So many more females survived the Titanic than the males. It's hard to imagine that, you know, that the sight of the ship um, going down, it took three hours for it to sink. And this is a quote, a fa famous quote from one of the survivors. The sounds of people drowning are something that I cannot describe to you, and neither can anyone else. It's the most dreadful sound, and there is a terrible silence that follows it. Uh, if you have an ancestor who was on the Titanic or a relative, there are now passenger lists available online. A lot of the records are actually held in London at the National Archives, so they've got Harland and Wolfe records. They've got a memorial website that was set up for the 100th anniversary, so you can search the passenger and crew list for free, and they've also got some nice little stories about some of the people who were on the ship. And you can now also see some of the original records on Find My Past. So they have the passenger list and the re registers of deceased passengers and the registers of the deceased seamen. And one of the, the people on board the ship, um, I don't know how many of you watch Call the Midwife, but Stephen McGann, the actor who plays uh, Dr. Turner in that, he has an ancestor who was on the Titanic. Um, and there's a very nice little video on YouTube where he is actually, for the first time, able to look at the original record of his ancestor, Titanic McGann, who actually survived the Titanic. And he's written a little book called Flesh and Blood where he's got stories about his ancestors and he's got the story of his Titanic ancestor in that book. Now, after the ship sank, um, the grim task of trying to retrieve the bodies began. And a number of boats were sent out to try and salvage the bodies. Um, there were life jackets for everyone on board, and a lot of the bodies were actually found in the sea in the life jackets, just floating in the water. Um, the water temperature was minus 4 degrees, the air temperature was minus 2, and in that sort of temperature, no one has a chance more than after about sort of five, ten minutes. Um, but only 334 bodies of the over 1,500 Titanic victims were actually found. Um, and because of the number of bodies, they, they actually ran out of the embalming materials, so some of the people were buried at sea. And those same class divisions still persisted if you were a first class passenger, you were actually buried in a, you had a wooden coffin and it was mainly the third class passengers who were buried at sea, three at a time and then buried overboard. 59 were claimed by relatives and taken home for burials in their um, home communities and there were 150 victims buried in three cemeteries in Halifax in Nova Scotia in Canada which was the nearest um, major port to the point where the ship came down. Um, so Fairview Lawn, Mount <coughs> Olivet and Baron de Hirsch. And, but the vast majority of the, the victims were buried at one particular location, Fairview Lawn Cemetery. 121 of those 150 victims were buried there. And of those victims, 42 um, have not been identified. <coughs> One of the most famous uh, gravestones in the cemetery is what is known as the Grave of the Unknown Child, erected to the memory of an unknown child whose remains were recovered after the disaster of the Titanic, April the 5th, 1912. And this grave has actually become symbolic not just of a single child, but of all the children who lost their lives at, uh, in, the, the, in the Titanic disaster. And when the, the, when the bodies were being uh, collected, they, the, 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 um, the officials began to take records to try and identify them. This is actually the, the record for what they labelled body number four. Um, and that was the only information that people had to go on to try and work out the, the, person, the, the child's identity. And you can imagine probably a lot of the children very, wearing very similar clothes at the time. Um, a lot of children would have had fair hair, rough, an estimated age of two. 
Now, initially, it was thought that the, this unknown child was a Swedish boy known as Gustav Paulsen. You have to excuse, excuse my pronunciation of Swedish. I'm not a, a Swedish language expert. Um, and there were eyewitness accounts of him being washed overboard, um, but the, the, there was also the fact that his mother was recovered and she was buried in a grave behind the unknown child, and she had the tickets for all four of the children in her pocket. But he was the right age, he had the right hair colour, and on the coroner's notes they'd even written Baby Paulson. So this was a case where DNA could possibly provide some answers. And for this type of investigation, um, the, the type of DNA that, um, certainly at the time that this um, study was done, is what's called mitochondrial DNA. Now, in each cell in our body, we, um, we have the, this structure, the circular structure in the middle is the nucleus, that's where all the chromosomes are, but you can see those little red globules around the edge, and those are the mitochondria. And there are hundreds or sometimes thousands of mitochondria in each cell, whereas there's only one of each chromosome. So if you're going to get any DNA, you have a much greater chance of getting some mitochondrial DNA than any other type of DNA. A mitochondrial DNA is a circular structure like this, and in, in the very early days of DNA testing, the only bit of the mitochondrial DNA that was normally sequenced was this bit at the top, that blue bit called the control region or the hypervariable region. These days, with more advanced tests, we can actually sequence the whole mitochondrial genome. Uh, there are, um, and the early tests would only actually, in fact, sequence just a half of that um, HVR region or control region. Um, and then the more advanced tests came along that would look at both sections of that. Um, but those two sections only cover 10% of the whole mitochondrial genome. And the rest of the genome is actually what's called the coding region, and there are 37 genes in there, and those are the part, that's the part of the mitochondrial genome where the, the mutations occur at a much slower rate. Now, the other important thing about mitochondrial DNA is the path of inheritance. So both males and females receive D mitochondrial DNA from their mother, but it's only the females who pass it on to the next generation. So that means that you're following this very one specific all-female line. Now, if you want to exhume a body, um, then you are not going to get permission to do so unless you have a reference sample available. So in this particular case, um, the uh, researchers had to get a reference sample from the relatives in Sweden so that when the body was exhumed, if they were able to extract DNA, they would have something to compare it with to give a yes, no answer as to whether that was his body. So the Titanic Ancient DNA Project began in the summer of 1998. This is actually very early on in terms of DNA technology. And it was led by two people, an anthropologist by the name of Ryan Parr and a historian who had a great interest in the Titanic by the name of Alan Ruffman. And they began their project by getting permission to exhume, in fact, three graves from Fairview Lawn Cemetery on behalf of three different families. So the, first, the, the grave number four was the, the one that was thought to be that of uh, Gusta Paulsen, and they'd managed to identify some relatives in Sweden to use as uh, comparisons. They also wanted to exhume grave number 240, and this grave was thought to belong to somebody called Charles Joseph Shawnee, who was a third-class passenger who'd set off to New York. Now, they were not able to find any matrilineal relatives but the relatives themselves agreed to let the researchers exhume the grave of Charles's father, who was buried in Sussex back in England. And they removed a femur and they did DNA testing on that. And the third grave that they um, exhumed was thought to be that of Catherine Jane Wallace, who was a matron looking after the emigrants who were on the Titanic. And her granddaughter was available for testing. And it was actually Joan Allison, the, the granddaughter, who was um, one of the people who was pushing for DNA testing to be done, because uh, she really wanted to know what had happened to her grandmother. <laughs> 
And these are the, the, the descriptions that we have for the, the, the presumed body of Charles Shawnee. We just got his age, his hair was possibly dark. And one of the, he, uh, the, the body had a watch um, which had a, a sign on it to say that it was from Brighton in England. And it was that watch that uh, led the researchers to believe it might be Charles Shawnee. And the um, grave number 281, believed to be Catherine Wallace. So again, we had a few details from the, um, the, the clothing she was wearing, but a distinctive wart on her index finger. So the exhumations began on the 17th of May, 2001, and went on for two days. And the first two bodies to be exhumed were the, the two adult bodies. Uh, but sadly, the uh, graves were completely waterlogged. And this is a quote from Ryan Parr, the researcher. No biologic material could be found in the two graves of bodies number 240 and 281. So in plain English, that means that the bodies had con dis completely disintegrated. There was nothing left at all. The only evidence of any burial was some wood from the coffin and the stems of a few flowers. So in both of those cases, DNA was not able to provide an answer. Um, they did go on to do another investigation with Charles Shawnee because for some of the corpses, they'd taken photographs. And they were able to do a comparison between a photograph of Charles Shawnee and a photograph of the corpse. Um, when the relatives looked at the photographs, they all thought, oh, yes, that, that looks very much like him. But when they called an independent expert to look at them, he looked at particular features like the eyebrows and also the ears and apparently the way the ears attached to the to the face, and um, that's very distinctive. And um, he concluded that just from the photos, um, the, the, the body was not that of Charles Shawnee. So neither, so neither um, the Shawnees nor, the, um, nor Joan Allison were able to get closure from any of these investigations, and the fate of their, um, their relatives is not known. But it was a different case from um, body number four, in grave number four, the unknown uh, child. And um, in this case, the, the, fortunately, the grave was actually on much higher ground, so it was above the water table, but there was still very little left of the body. There was just a small piece of bone and three baby teeth. But that was enough to get some DNA. And in spring 2002, they did the DNA testing, and they got the DNA from the bone, but they only sequenced a very small part of that hypervariable region, that control region part of the mitochondrial genome. And immediately they determined there was no match with um, the maternal relatives of Gustav Polson in Sweden, who was uh, thought to be the, the, the child in the grave. So then the pro and they also did a, an analysis of the teeth to get some further evidence. And the first analysis suggested it's probably a child under one year, and then some other experts concluded it was probably a child between about nine and 13 months old. So now the search began to find, to look to see which other um, children were on board the ship, and to try and find a, a matrilineal relatives who could take a test as a comparison. So um, from all the passenger records, they were able to identify six candidate males under three who were lost on the Titanic. And they began to do DNA testing on the relatives of all of them. And it, you can imagine it's a major genealogical task actually trying to um, identify these, um, all these relatives. And the, trying to identify on that maternal line is particularly troublesome because of the change of, of surname in, in most, most cultures, not so much in Sweden or in, in Finland. Um, and um, Gustav Paulsen was had already been ruled out through DNA testing. They then test and um, Gilbert Danbone, the youngest uh, baby on the on the ship, that um, was also he was also ruled out through DNA testing. As was Alfred Peacock. Um, the the last person on the list, Eugene Rice. At this point, his DNA hadn't been tested, but he was ruled out um, on the grounds that he was too old to be the candidate because of the dental evidence. So that left them with two candidates, and with the mitochondrial DNA testing, um, with just that limited amount of evidence, they both had identical mitochondrial um, signatures. <laughs> 
But because of the dental evidence, they decided that it couldn't possibly be Sidney Goodwin. The, all the people who'd examined the teeth were saying, oh, no, it has to be a very, very young child. So it was concluded, he was ruled out, and it was concluded that the body must be that of Ino Panula. So the, the family all came over for a ceremony. And an announcement, they sent out a press release um, that this unknown child was Aino Panula from Finland, and it was in all the newspapers at the time. And there was also a big programme that was on Channel 4, it was also on Canadian television, which told the whole story of the DNA research. And that um, video is actually on YouTube, and it's worth watching because it, it, they've got interviews with the relatives, and it also shows things like the photographic evidence and doing the comparison between the, the two, Charles Shawnee and the, the photograph from, from the corpse. Um, and the dental results were published in a um, Canadian um, dental journal, so and with all the details of the analysis and how they'd done the, the dating, a very technical uh, paper, but also it also included some details about the mitochondrial DNA analysis. So it seemed like it was all hunky-dory, case closed. But um, some further evidence came along. And the researchers were aware of the existence of these shoes while they were doing the documentary and while they were doing their mitochondrial DNA testing, but these shoes had not been authenticated at the time. But um, a, a policeman um, who had, a, 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 so the grandson of a policeman had come had approached the museum at the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic saying that he'd got this pair of shoes and they belonged to his grandfather. And his grandfather had been a policeman who'd had the, the duty of caring for the, um, the corpse, the, for the bodies and the, and the clothing of the, the deceased people. And the, all the clothing had to be burnt because they didn't want to have ghoulish souvenir hunters coming along and grabbing bits of clothing and taking it away as a, a souvenir. So, but he saw this, this pair of shoes and they were just so poignant that he just couldn't bear to throw them away. So he put them in his desk drawer Five years later, he retired, and he must have taken them home with his belongings. But his grandson decided that they ought to, really ought to be in the museum. And the museum was eventually able to authenticate them and date them to between about 1900 and 1925. They worked out that they were probably from England. But the crucial factor was that the shoes just seemed to be too big for a 13-month-old child. Um, and the researchers were beginning to have doubts. And one thing that they hadn't done normally with mitochondrial DNA testing, with any, any type of ancient DNA research, you have to test all the other people who were involved in the project. Uh, but Ryan Parr, the anthropologist, hadn't been tested. And when he had his DNA done, he was also a match with the Titanic baby and the Panula sample and the Goodwin sample. Um, so they were really starting to have doubts, and they, uh, to, to give them, uh, it, this was the very early days of mitochondrial DNA testing. There weren't many samples around, so people really didn't know about the frequencies of all these different signatures. But as, the, as um, research progressed, it became very apparent that certain mitochondrial DNA signatures are very prevalent in the population. This is haplogroup H, which if you've taken a mitochondrial DNA test, you may come across, which is the most common branch of the mitochondrial DNA tree. 40% of Europeans belong to this branch. So um, it was then decided that they really needed to do a reanalysis of the mitochondrial DNA, DNA evidence at a much higher resolution. So they went back and they looked at the, uh, they tested all the six um, samples, six um, samples again. Um, and they did it, they didn't do the full mitochondrial genome sequence, that technology still wasn't available, but they tested both HBR regions, and they also tested some markers from the coding region. And they chose a particular section of that where they identified there's more chance of finding some informative mutations. And uh, for, both, for those of you who've taken the mitochondrial DNA test, you'll know that um, even with a, a full mitochondrial sequence now, um, when you're trying to identify a common ancestor, um, even if you have an exact match on all the markers, the common ancestor could still have lived, um, you know, a thousand or more years ago. And if we just do an HBR1 test, which is what these researchers did in the early years, um, they won't even give you the 90% confidence interval. 50% of the time they say the common ancestor will be 
about um, 1,300 years ago. Now, for forensics, uh, forensic purposes, they're not interested in working out who the relative is. All they're trying to do is determine between six candidates as to which one is the, the, the person whose body is buried in the grave. So they, it's not necessary to have quite the same amount of detail. Um, so it took them a while to do all the, uh, all the uh, DNA testing, and then they did what they perhaps should have done in the first place. They published the results in a... Um, scientific journal in a peer-reviewed journal where they got all the technical details about the, um, the study and they were able to um, again eliminate the, the, the four of the, the boys, the same four boys that had been eliminated before and um, these are the results from the, um, the, the, the unknown child and the Goodwin and the Panula um, reference profiles. So in this case, you can see that the Goodwin child has an exact match with the unknown child. They both share that particular 9923T mutation there. And the Panula um, sample, that has a unique mutation there at position 146. What this is showing is differences from what's known as the Cambridge reference uh, sequence. They don't publish the whole sequence, they just give you the, the, the differences. So now we have um, pretty, well, it looks very good evidence that the body is likely to be that of um, Sydney Goodwin and not of Ino Panula. And it's um, the haplogroup H1U um, and 9923T is actually one of the defining mutations for that particular haplogroup. Unfortunately, they were not able to get any Y chromosome DNA. They only tried to get YSTR results, which is the, the, the normal markers that you use when you're doing the, your DNA matching. And when it, in the paper, it gives details about the frequency of this 9923T mutation. It's found in only three out of 6,000 occurrences in a, a big database known as GenBank. And when they looked at the number of sequences um, that had been published, um, there were only nine, there were 92 that matched the um, just the HBR1 profile, but only one of those actually shared that same um, mutation. So it was actually very very rare. And Ian Logan, some of you may know, is a mitochondrial DNA expert, and he's got a very nice mitochondrial DNA website. And he's he's also looked at the results, and he's got a he maintains a list of all the known sequences that are H1U. And there are only 36 now, uh, GenBank now has 40,000 mitochondrial DNA samples, and there are only 36 that have this um, rare mutation. Although intriguingly, there are 200 people on GEDmatch who say they're in this uh, haplogroup H1U, so some of them could possibly be related to the Titanic baby. And um, they then did a statistical analysis of the results um, using something called a, a Bayesian analysis, which I know John Reed in the audience is very familiar with, um, where, first of all, you look at the prior probability of being related, and here it was a one in six chance, because there were just six children to choose from, so you start off with a prior probability of 16.67%. And then they worked out something called a likelihood ratio. I'm not going to go into all of that. I'm sure John can give a very good lecture telling us how that works. But they worked out that the probability that the body was that of Sydney Goodwin was 98.81%. And to sum up in more plain English from their paper, the consistent profiles and especially the rare coding region polymorphism, which is a long name for a mutation, shared with the Goodwin maternal references indicate that the unknown child remains are most likely those of Sydney Leslie Goodwin. But no, notice they don't say proof, they don't give any certainty, 98.81%. Um, they didn't make a big fuss about this paper, they didn't go issue a press release, so they didn't, in fact, the, 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 they made the identification several years earlier. So this later research has actually received a lot less publicity than the original, um, somewhat premature press release. And one further mystery that has been, uh, I want, just wanted to discuss briefly, which is sometimes known as the last mystery of the, the Titanic, and this involves uh, um, uh, somebody who came forward later on, um, claiming to be um, a lady called Lorraine Allison. Now, Lorraine 
um, was thought to have died with her parents, Hudson and Bess Allison, on the Titanic. Their son, Trevor, survived but died at the age of 18 of food poisoning. Hudson Allison was a Canadian entrepreneur. He travelled with a retinue of servants in first class and clearly had a lot of money. Um, and then 19, in 1940, a lady who went by various names, who called herself Helen Kramer, sometimes Helen Lorraine Kramer, she came forward and made a public appeal on the radio claiming to be Lorraine Allison. And the story that she told was that uh, her father had told her just before she died um, that he wasn't her father and that he was actually Thomas Andrews, who was one of the architects of the Titanic, but who was thought to have died on the, uh, uh, when the ship went down. And uh, uh, she came up with this uh, story that um, uh, Hudson Allison had handed over Lorraine uh, Allison to um, Thomas Andrews and then brought, and he brought her up as his child. The whole story didn't really ring true and most of the family didn't believe it. Um, but some did actually take her seriously. But it, it was really upsetting for the family. They had a long, a lot, a long running disputes with her and they accused her of harassment and, she, and all sorts of things. Uh, and it was thought that in 1992, when she died, that was going to be the end of it. But it wasn't to be. In 2012, a lady called Debrina Woods, who was uh, Kramer's granddaughter, came forward on the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic and um, resurrected the case and restated all the claims. She said that she had a suitcase full of documents proving that her grandmother was Lorraine Allison. She got a book that she was going to write, movie deals signed up. She claimed to have had DNA results but never managed to uh, produce them. So it was decided uh, to try and use DNA independently of uh, Debrina Woods to try and find an answer. And a forensic scientist set up the Lorraine Allison Identification Project. And there's a dedicated website where you can read all about this project in more detail. And now Debrina Woods, um, somewhat suspiciously, decided she didn't want to have her DNA tested as part of the project. But her half-sister, Deanne Jennings, did agree to test. And they tested Sally Kirk Kirkley, who would have been the great-niece of Bess Allison. Now, if the hypothesis was correct that Helen Kramer was Lorraine Allison, we would expect the mitochondrial DNA results to match. Um, but the results came back and there was no match at all. So the story was publicised in the newspapers. Um, Debrina Woods still didn't accept the story. She said she had more evidence, but nothing else has ever um, been produced to um, refute those original findings. And I just to finish, I want to go back um, to the um, grave of Sydney, of the, the unknown child, which we now know is Sydney Goodwin. The family had a memorial ceremony there. Uh, back in 2008 when the results of the DNA testing came through but they decided because it was such an iconic grave and it, it, it was so symbolic not just of their, son, of their uh, um, relative but of all the other children, 53 other children lost their lives in this disaster and this gravestone represented all of them so they, they couldn't bear to, to remove it or erect a new gravestone so what they did was they just in, in, um, put a very very simple little um, footstone at the bottom of the grave with his birth date, his death date and the, that's the, both the gravestone number and the body number. So there's some interesting lessons from this. DNA testing is a very useful tool um, when you can actually get the DNA evidence, but it's not always the answer. You do need the genealogical records with the uh, DNA evidence. And we've seen here in two of the cases, there was no chance of getting any DNA at all. Um, so I think just, uh, I'd just like everyone to think for a minute of the 1,500 people who were on board this ship um, and the vast majority of those bodies were not recovered. Um, there is no DNA evidence, and for those people, there will never be any answer at all. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Well, a fabulous presentation. Thank you very much.
Um, does anybody here in the room have relatives or ancestors who are actually on the Titanic? We have one, two, oh, really? two people. Yeah. Do you, do you know a lot about your ancestor? I'll, I'll come over with the microphone and I'll just give it to you. So there's no chance of using no. any DNA testing on him. No. No. I've done my DNA, so hopefully someone will find it. Yeah. But it's really interesting. Yeah. I think one of the lessons to be learned from this, obviously they didn't know about DNA testing at the time, but the more people we have with their DNA tested, it, when there is a future disaster, we will have this ready-made, um, we will have ready-made reference samples as comparisons. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's great that you've actually had your mm. DNA tested. Now, what, what exactly is your relationship to him? Do you know? Do you know the actual oh, connection? Oh, sorry. I looked at my tree. Um, my mother, my grandmother was at Haskell, so it's about four or five to the side, and then, then there. Do you know if it's on the mother, mother, mother line up and mother, mother, mother line down? Because that would be the mitochondrial DNA route. So there's a mother, father, mother, uh, okay. Uh, if, if, if it varies between mother and father, then you've broken the path. Um, one of the things that um, we're trying to do with World War I soldiers, in fact, is try to identify uh, people who might be uh, DNA donors that might be informative in identifying some of the remains of the World War I soldiers that they recover every, every year. They have 30 or 60 remains being found and they identify them through a mother, mother, mother line going up and then mother, mother going down to the soldier. And uh, the same on the, on the Y DNA side, father, father, father going up and then son, son, son coming down to the soldier. And that way they can uh, use both types of information to uh, uh, hopefully identify the unidentified remains. So um, it, it's still useful as a, as a legacy to your relative to actually have your own DNA tested. <laughs> well, that next talk will be Michelle, <laughs> Michelle Leonard, and she'll be telling you all about that. And you had a relative on the... Well, it's a relative, yes, sir. It's a real, I have relatives on both sides, both as a passenger and also on the car and So, um, on the Titanic, there was a father, father. He drowned, but his wife and great new old daughter survived. And they got to New York. It was only this week I came across a photograph of the mother and eight-year-old daughter sat on the deck of a ship. The mother looks extremely distracted, the eight-year-old looks straight at the camera, mm -hmm. and across their laps they've got the white star mm -hmm. right. And at the same time, in the Carpathia, I uh, had a relative who uh, was awarded the Carpathia Medal, right. and he was working he subsequently married the waitress from uh, Carpathia. Oh, right. He survived, well, he helped out at the Titanic. He got sunk, he was on the tip of the Lusitania, had to be rescued from that, and two years later, mm. he subsequently the Carpathia himself. So, uh, mm. so he was not this person. Um, mm. Gosh, what are the chances that you're on two yes. ships going down? That's, that's an incredible story. Did anybody else have any connections with the Titanic? No? Well, those, are, those are two wonderful stories. Have you had your DNA done? or yes. You have as well? Yeah. yeah. And have, do you know if there are any uh, descendants of uh, your There are, yes. Uh, cousins, uh, it's got uh, descendants. And, uh, I mean, they did have Titanic money. But we also went, it was a big exhibition at the uh, 
went to the arena mm -hmm. seven years ago. Mm -hmm. We lost fashion in about two hours. Oh, interesting. Great. Um, other questions? Any questions at all for, for Debbie? Oh, we have a question over here from John Reed. Here we go, John. Great presentation. Um, the, the, this, this last test was done in 2008, and I think that's right. Um, well, they seem to have done the testing over a series of years, um, going right up to the publication of the paper. So even after they they published the you know, they got the documentary, they were still doing testing after that. Okay. Um, and then they, they went back and did the testing again at Brigham Young um, University. Scott Woodward did some of the testing there. Um, which, I mean, even at that time, the ancient DNA recommendations were to test at two separate labs, so they didn't follow the, the proper ancient DNA protocols at the time. Um, but I think it probably would have been about, it probably would have been about, two, I think, 2009. It does actually say, it gives the details in the paper. Yeah, I can't remember yeah. the exact date. Well, you're getting into my question because, I mean, mm. DNA testing has come a long way mm. since then. What would you think we would do today if we were... Well, today we would have it, it, we would have used next generation sequencing, and we would probably have got a whole mitochond. We would have got a whole gene. Well, not necessarily a whole genome, but certainly a pretty good, probably a pretty good um, genome out of it, as was the case with Cheddar Man. And that's a very similar example where, when the testing was originally done in 1997, they were only able to test HVR1. And now, um, they, with the late, with the, all the latest uh, technology, they were able to get a really good whole genome sequence, and not just the mitochondrial DNA, but the Y DNA and the, you know, the whole genome as well. Um, but whether I, I don't know whether this could be revisited because when I looked into this, they did actually one of the teeth was actually destroyed in the process of extracting the DNA, and I'm not sure that there was much of the bone left either. And then they decided to rebury the, 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 the teeth and the bone in the grave. So if it was going to be tested again, you'd have to exhume the body all over again. And there's not really any justification that you can make for doing that other than curiosity. Um, which is genealogist is something you know we all want to, to see. And in fact, I was at an ancient DNA conference last weekend, and one of the scientists was saying about the frustrations of always having to come up with a research question, and he was saying, let's just um, sequence the bejesus out of everyone, <laughs> all our ancient DNA samples, which I really sympathised with. But we can't just start going round and you know getting the DNA from every single gravestone in Ireland and England and Wales and Scotland, much as we'd like to. <laughs> um, well, what do you think are the chances of any of the other uh, victims of the Titanic being uh, identified? Well, I think one of the problems is going to be the preservation because of the location of the graveyard. Um, and it was only because the Titanic baby was in a higher location looking down on all the others. I, I would imagine that most of the other gravestones were similarly waterlogged. Grave, the, the graves are similarly waterlogged and there probably isn't any, any DNA left. But I was thinking about that and even if they did want to do that, it would be a marathon job because they've still got to find the, um, the reference samples um, and they've got very little to go on. And if you've just got, you know, sort of lots of men and women with just very bare um, descriptions of what they look like, it's a marathon task. And in the actual paper, there was a l huge long list of acknowledgements of all the people who did been involved in the genealogical research just for six peop six children. But when you've got all the adults as well, it, it, the, the research would be uh, phenomenal to do. It, it reminds me of the Femel project mm. and um, what they did in that situation, they found 250 soldiers buried in a mass grave. Mm. Um, they looked at the height of the soldiers and tried to match it against the height of the um, remains that mm. they found. Mm. And you could do something similar with the Titanic because you'll have a passenger list and you also, of course, have all the details of the bodies that were recovered. Yeah. But of course, you're only dealing with 334 bodies that were recovered. Mm. You'd actually have to trace the family trees of oh. all 1,500 yep, right. people yep. who were on the Titanic in mm. order to identify potentially, yeah. it's not going to be 334, it will be, how many people were buried? Um, 150 odd. 150, so to yeah. identify 150 you would have to do the ident uh, family trees for 1,500 yeah, people. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Then uh, get uh, informative DNA donors for all 1,500 
And usually you need mm. two on the Y DNA side, father, 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 two on the mother side, mother, mother, mother. So that gives you four per person, four multiplied by 1,500, mm. that's 6,000. Mm. So you would potentially need to test 6,000 people to identify 59. Yeah, that's right. I don't think it's something that would ever be contemplated somehow. The Australian government invested 20 million in the female project to do exactly that. Oh, right. Oof. So. Yeah. Any other questions for Debbie? Well, it just remains me to say thank you very, very much for a very entertaining presentation. Thank you very much. Now, the next presentation that will be here will be Michelle Leonard, who will be talking about autosomal DNA, like family finder test, and how to maximize its use in your family tree. And that will be in about 10 minutes' time. It's a bit shorter than I anticipated, actually. I thought I had more. Stop the recording. Yeah.